And um, I'm very happy to say that Rene Hulan is here with us today, the professor who has the Craig Dobbins chair at the Canadian Studies here in UCD, and she's going to MC the event. And Rene will be managing the questions together with myself and Irene Fogarty from the School of Archaeology. So we'll be managing the chat group, chat group behind the scenes. So please keep your questions coming in through the chat group rather than asking directly, because I believe we have an audience of over 100 people. Um, so finally, I would like to, I'm uh, really delighted to introduce you to James Kelly. So he's the CEO of um, ICUF and it's the Ireland Canada University Foundation that have made this speaking fellowship possible and that are enabling connections such as these today, which allows the possibility to have this conversation with our keynote speaker, Lisa Prosper, all the way from Canada around our conservation of cultural landscapes. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to James. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, uh, on behalf of uh, all of us in the Ireland Canada University Foundation, or ICUF, as we call ourselves, can I say it's our great pleasure to support this fellowship. Um, it's a uh, the, for those of you who don't know about the foundation, um, we've been in existence for uh, over 20 years. And in that period, we have given, uh, we've, we've awarded 500 travel scholarships, over 500 scholarships um, to Canadian and Irish researchers and scholars um, to facilitate travel between both countries. Um, so that's been kind of half and half uh, Canadians coming to Ireland and Irish traveling to Canada. And our mission um, underlying this, it's to build connections and friendship between both countries, but it's also to do so in a way that contributes to our society um, and contributes to sustainability on the planet. And so uh, this um, project, the, the project kind of underlying this fellowship, uh, as I mentioned uh, to you, Claire and Lisa, before we came on live, we were really, really delighted to see this application coming in and really delighted um, to see that it's, it's been chosen by our, our external assessors for, uh, for this award. It's in an area that is really clearly of, of huge importance here in Ireland, as well as in Canada. Um, so I'd like to congratulate uh, Lisa Prosper on this award as a fellow. We're delighted to see you here and I know that this is going to be, a, your talk's going to be of great interest to everyone here on the call. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Claire Cave of UCD School of Archaeology and her team there in coming to us with this, um, this proposal. Um, I mentioned that we have uh, awarded travel scholarships. Um, we have for some years, you know, we've awarded 500, but we, ha we have for some years been looking for ways that we can build a link between Ireland and Canada um, without always having to rely on travel and, and, the, and on the fossil fuels that that requires. And, um, but this past year with the uh, COVID pandemic, um, you know, one of the things that's really, I think, been a positive uh, thing to come out is this uh, fact that the world is now, you know, open to the idea of coming together and meeting online and um and this is a really exciting aspect for of, of our work now is this new program arising from that called the beacon uh, fellowship program which facilitates this kind of connection from distance now we do realize and recognize that it's so important that people meet you know that's you know once the once we can i think we're all dying to get out and kind of contact and meet other people and that will always be part of our work facilitating meeting but but this online um, space offers really exciting opportunities such as this and this is one of a number of beacon fellowships that we are uh, we are making this year um all in all we'll have um over i think it's 18 18 or 19 um uh, on, in the current year and all of the videos of these, uh, along with this, will be available online to view on our website. And there's a really uh, 
a fascinating and broad range of lectures um, uh, from Irish speaking fellows um, speaking into Canadian universities and institutions and likewise Canadians um, talking uh, into uh, Irish universities such as in this case. So if anyone is interested um, in finding out more about our program and seeing some of these videos, my colleague Amanda is going to put a link in the chat room, in the chat box, so we can sign up for newsletters or even just to, to take a look at the website and see some of the work that we've been doing. Um, so that's the public, very public aspect of this program, and that's really important. But what the other aspect of, of it is that there are follow on events for every Beacon Fellowship. And um, Claire and her uh, team and students here and other uh, colleagues will have the opportunity following this lecture over the coming week or two to meet with Lisa in smaller groups. And this is a very, for us, a very important part of this program. So there's the opportunity to actually have those conversations now and getting to know each other. And, and, uh, and that we hope that between the broader uh, public lectures like this and those smaller events that this program will help to build uh, longer, long lasting connections and friendships. Um, so just finally to say that I, I wish you, uh, Claire and Lisa and your colleagues and, and everyone who's kind of connecting into this, the very best for this fellowship. It's an exciting uh, subject um, and uh, I think it has a potential to build connections that will last. Actually, there, there are two other things I need to say. First of all, I, of course, I need to thank our funders. Um, we're funded by the Canadian government to the Global Affairs, um, Global Affairs Canada and the Irish government through the Emigrant Support um, Programme of the Department of Foreign Affairs. The other thing I wanted to mention is this event that we are running this week called Landspeak, which is an online uh, a four day event, which is connecting indigenous peoples of Canada and um, of Turtle Island with people, uh, people of Ireland. And it's a series of events and I can see um, I'm going to introduce Renee shortly, who's one of our collaborators in this uh, initiative. Um, but it's a, it's a really exciting, uh, another online opportunity to build engagement um, between our lands, uh, engagement around um, song and story and ideas and sport. So that website, um, I think Amanda might put a link in the chat for that as well. That is landspeak.ie and it's all free and it starts uh, on Wednesday with an event the, for the Irish people um, watching here. You may know Liam and Wainley. He's going to be involved. Now this is the uh, homeschooling noises in the background here. Uh, the Home Office, we're all familiar with this. Um, I will, I think I've said everything I need to say anyway, just to, to wish you the very best uh, uh, for this. And it's my great pleasure now to call on um, Renee Hulan, who is the uh, Craig Dobbin, Chair of Canadian Studies in UCD for this year. Um, so, Renee, over to you. Thank you, James. Um, just to echo what James said about how exciting it is to welcome Lisa Prosper today and to congratulate her on her Beacon Fellowship. It's my honor to introduce her to you today. Uh, Lisa is a cultural heritage consultant with extensive experience in Indigenous cultural heritage and the theory and practice of cultural landscapes. She works with federal and First Nations governments in Canada in the areas of Indigenous cultural heritage conservation policy and world heritage. Her work fo focuses on supporting Indigenous people in the management of their heritage by increasing its broader understanding and recognition. So to do this, Lisa also works with governments, organizations, and industry to integrate Indigenous cultural heritage into planning and development activities in urban spaces. As a member of the Board of ICOMIS Canada and the International Scientific Committee on Cultural Landscapes, Lisa participates in the ongoing discussion on the integration of cultural and natural values in relation to the World Heritage Convention, as well as its accommodation of Indigenous cultural heritage. She also co-organized the National Conversation 
on cultural landscape, which was a cross country initiative to foster a broader conversation on cultural landscapes, both within and outside the field of heritage conservation. And I can tell you that this work in Canada is vital and it is some of the most important work being done in our country currently. Lisa is a member of the Acadia First Nation and holds degrees in art history and heritage conservation. Um, and she's a current member of the Indigenous Cultural Heritage Advisory Council for Parks Canada. And being from the uh, Acadia First Nation gives me the chance to uh, do a, an acknowledgement uh, of the place that I, where I normally live, I'm in Dublin now, but uh, which is in Halifax. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Acadia First Nation is in Mi'kmaq, and that is uh, the eastern coast of uh, North America. It is uh, the area of the, uh, the communities of the Acadia First Nation are in southwestern what's now Nova Scotia and uh, occupying areas of Mi'kmaq, which is the unceded, very important to say, territory of the Mi'kmaq people. So on behalf of all of us in the audience, I'm looking very much, I'm looking forward to your presentation and welcome, Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, here's where we get to do our little uh, tricky dance here and share screen. So um, bear with us for a second. We did test run this, so um, hopefully it goes uh, smoothly. You should see a fox with its head in the snow. Perfect. Okay, I see you all laughing. Great. Um, <laughs> okay, here we go. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you to the Ireland Canada University Foundation and to Dr. Claire Cave of University College Dublin for this opportunity to be with you today. I would like to start by saying that I am grateful to be living and working on the traditional territories of the Tan Quachon Council and the Kwanlin Dun First Nation. So I am speaking to you from Whitehorse uh, this morning, which is morning, my, my time. Um, and in a very Canadian fashion, I will give you an update on our weather, um, which is to say that spring is uh, quite slow to arrive, unfortunately. And um, we feel very much still in the midst of winter. Um, and despite being a, technically a semi-arid climate, we have received record snowfall this year. Um, and so that is why my background picture shows you uh, a summer scene with no snow because I've had enough of it. Um, nonetheless, I regret uh, not being able to be with you uh, in person um, as I would have enjoyed that. My presentation, Lived Spaces, will focus on Indigenous cultural landscapes in Canada, which is a subject I have worked on for many years. I see the presentation as an opportunity to share with you some of the reasons why I found Indigenous cultural landscapes such a compelling area of heritage and why I think they offer us so much for reflection. I'll start by describing some of the characteristics of Indigenous cultural landscapes through a few examples and then reflect on some of the lessons we've learned so far and then move on to what opportunities remain, I think, for further learning. But first, what are cultural landscapes? This is a question that I continue to wrestle with and I'm sure I will as long as I'm in this field. Uh, however, we will turn to UNESCO's def definitions as they um, are the most um, perhaps well-known um, and tend to inform um, even municipality, you know, if they're developing a cultural landscape definition, they will often turn to uh, UNESCO as a, as a starting point. So let's start there. Um, so UNESCO defines cultural landscapes as the combined works of nature and of man and has set out three main categories. The first, uh, clearly defined landscapes, um, which describe landscapes which have been designed 
and created intentionally by man. So you can think of places like Versailles, for example. The second category, organically evolved landscapes, are landscapes that have evolved over time in response to their natural environment. Now that's a broad category um, and thankfully so. I think that um, it probably uh, touches on the majority of cultural landscapes, um, at least um, that respond most to community uh, type cultural landscapes. And then there's associative cultural landscapes. And these are landscapes where religious, artistic, or cultural associations of a natural element or elements are more significant than the material cultural evidence. Despite these distinctions, elements of each category can often be found in every cultural landscape. So Canada has a long tradition of cultural landscape heritage as some of these images suggest. We have Battle Harbor, Newfoundland on the left, which is an organically evolved landscape, but clearly has some designed elements and certainly uh, has some associative significance as well. The Rideau Canal World Heritage Site in the middle, again, a designed landscape, but throughout its uh, full trajectory through smaller communities in Southern Ontario, there is certainly an organically evolved element to that landscape as well. And then the Queenston Heights um, landscape on the right commemorating the Battle of 1812 is designed. However, the associative elements are um, clearly um, part of its significance as well. Given the geographical breadth of Canada and the multicultural character of its population, it is no surprise that its cultural landscape heritage covers a vast range of places and the associated heritage of many different communities. The qualities of the landscapes pictured here likely have very similar attributes to many European cultural landscapes, where there is a distinct physical imprint in the landscape that is the result of man's interaction with that place. In some ways, the UNESCO categories of cultural landscapes render landscapes as buildings where the significance of their value is understood primarily through their form. My focus on indigenous cultural landscapes is in part because I have always felt that they have so much to teach us. Early in my studies, I realized that what were central tenets of the conventional heritage framework were not easily reconciled with those of an indigenous heritage perspective. This was also a time when the conventional heritage framework was becoming aware of its shortcomings, especially in its ability to accommodate the cultural heritage of the world's indigenous peoples. I have always believed that indigenous cultural landscapes can help shift our thinking on how to better accommodate cultural diversity and how to be more responsive to the needs of these diverse communities in the 21st century. My intention is not to advocate for Indigenous cultural landscapes as a type of heritage. In fact, I would argue that the heritage field as a whole is already overly preoccupied with typologies. But to try to learn some lessons from them as a system of heritage value and expression. What I will be trying to capture here is how Indigenous people's heritage is anchored in their relationship with the land. Naming this a cultural landscape is not meant to typify this heritage. It is only a way of giving form to this relationship so that the heritage field can understand. And I should say that I will be speaking from a Canadian context and more specifically from a somewhat Northern context. Throughout the presentation, I will be referring to a number of examples of Indigenous cultural landscapes in Canada. And so I thought it would si I would situate them for you um, on a map. So working from west to east and from north to south, um, we'll start with Herschel Island, Kikikarik Territorial Park, 
um, which is associated with the Inuvialuit and Gwich'in communities. Just below that, um, almost touching actually, um, is Ivivik National Park, also associated with the Inuvialuit uh, and Gwich'in communities. Further down below is Trondek Klondike, um, and this is associated with the Trondek Gwich'in. And below that, Yukon Ice Patches, which is associated with the Carcross Tagish First Nation. Now, all four of those are in the Yukon Territory, and they are all currently on Canada's tentative list for World Heritage Sites. Moving eastward, um, in the middle of the screen is Sayue Adacho National Historic Site, and this is associated with the Satagatin um, community. And then way down in the corner um, is Pamatuanaki World Heritage Site. And this is um, um, quite unique in as much as it is um, associated with the four different First Nation communities, uh, the Blood Vein, Little Grand Rapids, Pongasi, and the Poplar River First Nations. So rather than trying to define Indigenous cultural landscapes in abstraction, um, I thought I would reflect on what I think we're learning from them and use that as a way to bring them to life for you. But to get us started, it will, be, it will still be useful to identify some of their general characteristics, as these may be different from what one normally understands as characteristics of a cultural landscape. So generally speaking, in the Canadian context, Indigenous cultural landscapes cover large areas as they often relate directly to a nation's traditional or ancestral territory. They may be predominantly natural areas with little or no material evidence of a community's association with the place, at least not in the way that we have seen of other cultural landscapes. This can be for a number of reasons, but foremost among them is that the relationship between a community and the land is primarily expressed in immaterial ways or what the field calls intangible cultural heritage. That is not to say that material evidence cannot exist in either archeological or other physical form, but it is often one of many cultural expressions associated with the place that makes the landscape significant for the community. As we'll see, archaeology can play an important role in reconnecting a community to a place and enhancing their understanding of their history. But the point is that these are not primarily built landscapes. The corollary to this is that Indigenous cultural landscapes are largely dependent on immaterial or intangible expressions for their existence, their significance, and their effective management. So what are some of the component elements that we have to come to understand as characterizing Indigenous cultural landscapes? At the start of my career, I would have said that we were beginning to develop an understanding about the inextricability of culture and nature and the way this relationship is both manifested and sustained over time and space. And we were understanding the component elements that make up an Indigenous cultural landscape and the interplay and interdependence of these elements. And these include land and land use, such things as traveling, hunting, camping, foraging, uh, traditional laws and traditional knowledge which serve to inform and instruct how to be on the land in a good way. Specific places and place names, these can serve as anchor points for storytelling and navigation, archeological sites, cultural practices such, are, such as games, gatherings, food and clothing preparation, and stories and language. 
I'll explore a few of these next. This is an image of the porcupine caribou herd in Ivavik National Park in the Yukon Territory. As I mentioned earlier, the park is one of three contiguous sites that make up one of the properties on Canada's tentative list for World Heritage. The park was established as part of the Inuvialuit Final Agreement to protect the calving grounds of the herd. Its name, Ivavik, means a place for giving birth or a nursery. Hunting caribou, either in Ivavik or along the herd's migration route, does not leave many permanent physical traces in the landscape, but it is nevertheless connected to and supported by the natural features of the landscape. When they saw the stars and when it got a little darker, they say about now the caribou skins are good for clothing. Then they would start going up and from below the West Channel, they would start dog packing from there. They went up to get good skins of caribou for their clothing. At one time, my dad took me up there to Sorry, get some Sorry, Lisa, have we lost your sound there? Um, no, sorry, that's okay, me. Okay. Apologies. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, at one time, my dad took me up there to get some caribou for clothing. He said it was for winter use. Long ago, they say the light ones, the light colored caribou, are good and their fur is good for hunting. They are easier to use when moving around. I think she means they're more supple. One week we would stay up there looking for clothing from caribou skins. That's how it was long ago. So this quote from Kathleen Hansen demonstrates how the relationship between the caribou and the Inuvialuit has been integral to their well-being and their cultural identity for generations. This is a traditional land use map of the Yukon North Slope, the northern area of Ivavik National Park that slopes down to the Beaufort Sea. It demonstrates the degree to which encampment and hunting sites, travel routes, and areas associated with traditional activities and traditional knowledge permeate an otherwise natural landscape. In fact, my background image um, and a, uh, an image coming up uh, further in the presentation, I'll point it out to you, is depicting exactly this area. And you'll see um, it looks uh, just um, like a wide open natural space. These traditional land uses constitute the cultural layer of the landscape that acts as the thread that knits the Inuvialuit and the land together. This connection is sustained and renewed over time through contemporary land use, traditional knowledge, place names, stories, and other cultural practices that are passed down from elder to youth. For many indigenous people, the idea of cultural heritage simply describes living in relation to the land and each other according to the traditional laws and knowledge of their people. The Tronekwichin live in and around Dawson City on the Yukon and Klondike rivers and are the main proponents of the Trondike Klondike property on Canada's tentative list for world heritage. Trondike have lived along the Yukon River for thousands of years and as you all may or may not know, at the turn of the century, upwards of 100,000 gold prospectors arrived in their homeland um, in search of, of uh, the big gold find. While short-lived, the immensity and intensity of the Klondike gold rush changed the lives of the Trondike Quichin. However, they survived by adapting, and today they continue to live on their ancestral lands. We are Denezhu, the people of this land. We are Trondekwichin, the people of this river. Trehude is our way of life, our law. Living our law by engaging with our land has shaped our culture, 
and created our identity. We are obligated to uphold a reciprocal relationship with the land and all our living things and to maintain the integrity of our homeland as an interconnected entity. As this quote demonstrates, indigenous laws and knowledge constitute a framework for how to live in relation to the land and each other in a good way. Traditional land-based knowledge is a collective knowledge of traditions used by indigenous peoples to sustain and adapt themselves to their environment over time. Passing it on from one generation to the next makes it both resilient and responsive to the needs of the community in relation to their environment at any given time. Being on the land and retaining indigenous languages are both critical to the retention, generation and transmission of traditional knowledge that sustains traditional land uses and cultural practices. This is an image of the Yukon ice patches, another property on Canada's tentative list for world heritage. As a refuge from heat and bugs during the summer months, woodland caribou would congregate on ice patches, making them critical harvest areas for indigenous hunters. Weapons and tools made of otherwise perishable materials, such as wood, sinew and feathers that missed their mark thousands of years ago are now being revealed in remarkably well-preserved condition as climate change causes the ice to melt. This property is an example of how archeological sites can play an important role in a community's knowledge about themselves and their ancestors. They can reconnect people to specific places on the land, which can foster a cultural re-engagement or renewal with both the place and the uses with the place that express and sustain its significance. Cultural practices play a vital role in sustaining the connection of indigenous people to their lands and in transmitting their traditional knowledge to the next generation. In as much as indigenous heritage is anchored in a relationship with the land, it is equally dependent on a suite of immaterial ideas and practices such as storytelling, ceremonies, dances, arts, ideologies, hunting and trapping, food gathering, preparation and storage, spirituality, beliefs, teachings, etc., for its survival. In this photo of a moose hide tanning camp in the Tlico community of Wati, we see the intergenerational transfer of skills and knowledge between elder Sophie Willia on the right and Teresa Romy on the left and a young student, as together they stretch the moose hide to a frame in preparation for scraping. So to return to my original question, what is it that we're learning from indigenous cultural landscapes? I, I should qualify to answer that question um, to say first off that I think it's an ongoing process. However, I think we've learned about a more holistic idea of heritage that does not break down easily or usefully into types of heritage. The conceptual and disciplinary distinctions between the natural and cultural conservation fields, between tangible and intangible heritage serve to dismantle an otherwise holistic heritage system. Expertise, funding, and other mechanisms of support are correspondingly dispersed along these disciplinary lines, becoming a further barrier to meeting the heritage needs of Indigenous communities. And we've learned of how a living heritage is grounded or anchored in the land. Indigenous cultural landscapes are perhaps, perhaps best described as the relationship between the land and the people who inhabit it. So neither the land on its own, nor the people and their cultural practices on their own constitute a cultural landscape, but the interrelationship and interdependence of the two. 
As a field, we continue to explore this interrelationship of nature and culture and have begun asking questions about the accommodations that need to be made in conventional heritage frameworks in order to adequately embrace and better serve this heritage system more effectively and more meaningfully. Oh, I was going to point out um, as a brief aside that this is the picture of the Yukon North Slope in Ivavik National Park, which is exactly the same spot um, that traditional land use map was referencing. In the World Heritage context, this has set us on a path to rethinking how ECOMOS and IUCN undertake site evaluations as a result of the Connecting Practice Initiative. And it has prompted ECROM to begin development on a manual for the integrated management of cultural and natural values at World Heritage sites. Another recent initiative to mention is the online portal Panorama that hosts an ever-growing body of case studies that highlight the nature culture nexus in properties around the world. I think this is an invaluable tool as it helps us to understand the degree to which the relationship between a people and the land they inhabit forms the basis for cultural identity and well-being for a great number of cultures around the world and to learn from their different experiences. But is that all we can learn from Indigenous cultural landscapes? What opportunities are there for further learning? And I think the following are emerging as new themes we need to be focusing on, not to be um, forgetting the previous ones I've just mentioned. Indigenous cultural landscapes also encourage us to shift our focus away from the material expression of heritage to the living heritage system that sustains it, where, for example, both land and language are understood as critical components and carriers of value. Pamatuan, a key World Heritage Site, is recognized as an exceptional testimony to a living cultural tradition. Keeping the land describes a 7,000 year old cultural tradition for how the Anishinaabe care for Pamatuaniki, or the land that gives life. By one, honoring the creator's gifts. Two, respectful behavior toward other beings. And three, respectful behavior with people. This cultural tradition is passed down from one generation to the next in traditional knowledge and teachings told through stories and songs, which were made in Anishinaabemowin, which remains in everyday use. The critical connection between Anishinaabe and Pimatuanaki is dependent on both the land itself and the language through which it is understood. One Anishinaabe elder is quoted on the Pimatuanaki website explaining, it is important that a person maintains his or her language in order to understand the land. It is also important to find ways of articulating Indigenous heritage that are not reliant on the legacy of types in the conventional heritage framework. Focusing on articulating the attributes of Indigenous heritage on its own merits in terms of its relationships to the land and giving voice and language to the diversity of Indigenous ways of knowing and Indigenous ways of being is an important next step. One of the ways of doing this is to rely on Indigenous concepts as expressed in Indigenous languages, as we see here in Pumatuanaki, that can capture ideas and Indigenous people's relationships to land that are not otherwise part of the heritage discourse. I think greater attention to the role of language in all forms of heritage has the potential to be the next vanguard in heritage conservation. Language is both the expression of a worldview and a critical component of cultural identity and ultimately gives meaning to the heritage system of cultures around the world. We would do well to reflect on the diversity of ways 
the heritage value of places is articulated and communicated in language. This is Sayawaya Dacho in the Northwest Territories, recognized as a National Historic Site in 1997. It's made up of two peninsulas on the Great Bear Lake, and the cultural landscape has a particularly important teaching, healing, and spiritual places fundamental to the transmission of Satyagatin culture. Believing the land is alive with stories, Satyagatin stories are associated with specific places. Through these stories and place names, the history, cosmology, spiritual, cultural, and ethical values of, land, of law, sorry, ethical values, law, and land use are passed from generation to generation through language. Today, cultural learning and healing programs play a central role in passing on Sadukatin culture to the next generation. Inspired by Laura Jane Smith's idea of heritage work, described in her 2006 book, Uses of Heritage, a second area for further learning from Indigenous cultural landscapes is understanding the work being done by heritage for some communities, especially in light of the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada. The commission documented the experience of students of the Indian residential school system and other assimilationist policies enacted by the federal government on the Indigenous people in Canada and concluded that, I quote, the destruction of those structures and practices that allow the group to continue as a group, end quote, constituted cultural genocide. One of the legacies of assimilationist policies among myriad other impacts of colonialism has been the untethering of indigenous people from the constitutive elements of their cultural identity, namely connection to homeland, traditional life ways and laws and language. This has meant that recognizing and enabling the full expression of indigenous cultural heritage is critical to honoring and supporting resiliency and fostering cultural pride, dignity and self-determination in the face of ongoing challenges. Indigenous cultural heritage works to reaffirm indigenous people's connections to land, language, life ways and laws as well as reclaim authority over the practices and expressions by which these connections are sustained. How this work happens is largely through the various elements we've been discussing so far, language, traditional knowledge, land use laws, stories, and practices, as we just saw at Sayuri Adacho. As a repository and catalyst for key elements of an indigenous heritage system, indigenous cultural landscapes can make rich and important contributions to the broader heritage objectives of a community. They can teach us to attend to the cultural work of heritage and not heritage as an end in itself, as a tool or mechanism for achieving community goals. My final example is Herschel Island, Kikiktarik, situated just off Yukon's north coast in the Beaufort Sea. A very rich and layered landscape that touches on many of the issues we've been discussing so far. I'll give you a brief run through of some of the historical layers of the island to give you a sense of the complexity of the landscape. So Herschel Island has evidence of long-standing pre-contact use by the Inuvialuit. At the turn of the century, it was host to a very large whaling community of a population of over 2,000 people on this very small island. That whaling boom, of course, introduced the arrival of a colonial presence in the form of um, trading company, um, the church, and the Northwest Mounted Police. As soon as the whaling stocks depleted, there was essentially an abandonment um, of that activity. And then in the 1980s, 
as the Inuvialuit were negotiating their final agreement. They made, um, uh, they made space for the park establishment um, in the 1980s. That was followed very quickly by an oil and gas boom and bust in the Beaufort Sea. So again, um, an increase of um, sort of um, outsider presence um, for that. And since um, it has become a climate change science hub, um, the island and this whole coastline is under severe threat from changing climactic conditions, such things as uh, coastal erosion, permafrost slumping, uh, and very large storm events are um, sort of uh, eating away at the island. Its perceived remoteness and multi-layered history brings into relief the challenges of managing complex sites. The conservation of colonial infrastructure on the island is resourced by a largely absent constituency. There are no permanent residents on the island and it re receives very few visitors a year. And the island seems to be repeating the cycle of presence and absence of outsiders. In this case, as I mentioned, climate scientists from Europe and around the world. What I wanna focus on here is the contemporary Inuvialuit layer. Despite years of colonial imposition in their lives, including residential schools and the flu pandemics that severed, severed their access to the land, the Inuvialuit continue to make use of the island as they have done for thousands of years. The island remains a seasonal fishing, whaling and hunting site Community members continue to travel across the land following many of the traditional use routes we saw in the earlier map and making use of traditional knowledge to navigate and frequent successful hunting sites. A couple of days journey by snow machine from the nearest community, it also remains a popular stopping over place for community members traveling to and from Alaska to visit family relations. Some culture camps also take place on the island where Inuvialuit elders gather with youth to spend time together on the land, passing on traditional knowledge about living on the land, fishing and their connection to this place. There is an on-site seasonal ranger program where Inuvialuit rangers live on the island throughout the summer months. The development of this program created the opportunity for traditional land use studies and oral history projects to be undertaken that documented the knowledge of elders who had lived through many comings and goings of the white man since the turn of the century. The ranger's time on the island coincides with the arrival of climate research scientists from around the world. Together, these seasonal encounters foster the co-creation of new traditional knowledge that benefits from both scientific and Inuvialuit traditional knowledge, hopefully teaching us all about the perils of climate change on locationally vulnerable communities and threatening the world's cultural diversity. The heritage field has the opportunity and obligation to respond to the needs of diverse communities the world over. Indigenous cultural landscapes offer much for reflection on how we might begin to heed the call. Thank you. Super, thank you very much, Lisa. Wonderful presentation. I just want to see, do we have any questions coming through? Yes, thank you so much. That was a fabulous presentation. While we have comments in the chat saying what a great presentation it was, um, as we look for some questions, um, Maybe I'll, I'll ask as people are typing, perhaps. Um, I was fascinated by what you were saying about um, 
the need to encourage and enable language revitalization. And I was wondering, has, you know, with the work you're doing to raise uh, the awareness within heritage and, and uh, the recognition of uh, indigenous ways of knowing, has there been, has, has there been an uptake in heritage for, for doing programming or collaborations that would um, support communities in, uh, in maintaining those uh, language connections to the land? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think it's on everyone's radar <laughs> that language um, constitutes a critical piece of cultural heritage, um, and I would say that um, the majority of community-led uh, heritage initiatives almost always start with language. So the, the community priority is almost always about language learning, language retention, language documentation, all of these sorts of activities. I think primarily because elder communities are, um, are on their way out and, and they are the, the holders uh, in a lot of cases of, um, of the Indigenous language. Um, but I think that what has, at least in my experience, what I have found is that um, these disciplinary distinctions within the heritage field mean that um, uh, uh, when, we, when, we, when we go to look for heritage, we go to look to try and um, uh, conserve, preserve, save heritage, uh, we sort of have these conceptual blinders on. And it means we go, we go looking for something that we can affect because that's our training. So we know, okay, I, I, this is my background. I can, I can intervene in this way. This is how I can support. Okay, language is over here because that's an entirely different sector, uh, disciplinary sector, um, despite recognizing its importance, right? So uh, in some ways, um, there's the practical challenges, as I mentioned, of sort of uh, finding funding or knitting programs together. Um, but I think also there's conceptual challenges that we hold or that we bring to the, to the table um, that inhibit uh, our ability sort of to, sort of, to sort of see the broader connections. Um, and I guess one example of that is my own career when I started I was very much concerned about this nature culture thing um, and this sort of seemingly um, arbitrary distinction between those two things. Um, and so I just kept picking away at that. Okay, how, how many times can I describe that nature and culture are not separate? How many different ways can I try and communicate the, you know, and I can, still can't do it, right? The, the, the sort of the, the <laughs> inextricability of those two things. Um, and honestly, really only since living in the North has this notion of language sort of hit me like a two by four as the missing piece. It's, it's the language land piece. That is the critical for me. Uh, uh, like I said, coming at this kind of intellectually, that's, that seems to be the missing um, piece. And I think that's why I'm suggesting, I think that realization um, needs to start to penetrate the field and we need to start thinking about um, how, how that enriches how we do our work. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Yes, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll just see, we have um, a question from, let me see, Irene Fogarty, I think is our first question here. Um, Irene writes, one of our participants mentions the problem with the dichotomous approach of splitting nature and culture in a world heritage context. Um, and Pitchman Aki is, is a First Nations led world heritage nomination that ran into difficulties with these is issues. Can you speak of this a little? Sure. Um, so my understanding of, of, of uh, I wasn't 
involved. So this is very much a uh, second, third, fourth hand uh, understanding. But um, I think they ran into troubles initially with the assessment by the advisory groups. So by ECOMOS and IUCN, who at that time uh, were undertaking independent um, evaluations of the property. Um, and the um, subsequent nomination, because I think they nominated, they, they put forward two different uh, nominations. And I believe in the second nomination, they might also have shifted their uh, cultural criteria to uh, try and capture ultimately what ended up being uh, nominated. Um, and um, the assessment by ICOMOS and EUCN to that second nomination um, was done uh, slightly more jointly. And I think that helped to um, harmonize, if you will, how they were um, understanding the values of the site. Um, apologies, it's not, it's not a, um, uh, not a, I'm not an expert on Pumachuan or Key, but um, that was my understanding. Thank you. Um, William Noah Todd asks, um, how do Indigenous cultural landscapes feed into the national heritage narrative and discourse? Feed into the national or natural? Uh, it said national. I think that's what he meant. <laughs> sure. Um, well, that's interesting. I mean, the National Historic Site System in Canada has recognized quite a few um, Indigenous cultural landscapes. Uh, I don't. I don't know the number offhand, but certainly. Um, it is a part of um, uh, the new system plan that National Historic Sites has just released um, on the commemoration of, um, of national of sites of historical significance in Canada. Um, but yes, definitely they have been um, quite a number of recognitions. Sayue Adacho, if I'm not mistaken, was the first one. And that was back in 97. So since then, there have been um, quite a few. Um, and I guess uh, we were talking a little bit about this in the uh, pre, before you all joined, as this idea that um, sometimes these cultural lands, this is why I don't like typologies, these cultural landscape conversations are actually happening in the nat nat natural field. So um, for example, recently Canada went through an exercise called um, Pathways to Target One in their attempt to achieve uh, the Aichi target. Um, and, you know, Parks Canada undertook a uh, countrywide engagement with Indigenous for, um, uh, peoples. Uh, they set up a, uh, a methodology by which it was, it was led by Indigenous peoples um, to discuss precisely um, indigenous protected and conserved areas, which is what it sounds like. I mean, it's a way of setting aside um, a piece of land um, primarily for natural conservation purposes. I mean, it's about sort of um, uh, protecting and keeping out development and those sorts of things, but ultimately for both a natural and a cultural objective, right? Um, so in my mind, uh, an IPCA is a cultural landscape. It's just that it doesn't, the, the language is doing us a disservice here, right? Um, and, and so all of that to say that, you know, if you were to say, where is there a, a distinct conversation about indigenous cultural landscapes across the country? It's sort of happening across disciplines and, and, and in, in, a, in a myriad, uh, different ways. Um, and I would say that, you know, a lot of even, the, for example, the culture camp I showed or those sorts of ideas that are focusing on a cultural practice, whether that's moose high tanning or berry picking or other, um, other fishing, other activities, those are still um, 
land-based cultural activities. So that is still the knitting of nature and culture together, right? Um, and so they think they're talking about culture camps. In my mind, I'm saying that's a cultural landscape. So um, it is, it, it, the, the, the conversation around it is happening. Um, it's just, people may not be self-identifying that as a cultural landscape conversation. Great. Um, uh, we have a few more here. Uh, Doug Evans asks, says, I heard you say we need to develop our understanding of the work they do regarding opportunities we have to learn more. Could you please explain that again? So I think what I was trying to get at is, you know, as a, as a heritage field, generally a conventional heritage framework, um, you know, way back, you know, to, um, I'm going to get my king wrong, Louis the something or other, but at any rate, you know, I mean, this idea of um, constructing national identity through the marking of culture through buildings and so on, and sort of the aggregate of that to say, here, we have this building here, this one, this one, and so we're a people, this is our, our national identity, etc. So this, you know, it's, 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 it has always been uh, a fairly constructed activity, right? We're constructing identity. Um, so we've always deployed heritage to a purpose. We just don't always reveal or are transparent about that purpose. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have said um, that heritage is a fairly nostalgic exercise um, and um, so on and so forth. So I guess what I'm getting at is what if we were to ask that question? What, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? What is the objective of this? What can be achieved through these heritage activities? Um, and I would say that Indigenous peoples know. They know what they're trying to achieve through these activities because that is, in fact, how uh, cultural heritage and knowledge and so on get passed on. Um, but as a field, we're a little bit less um, uh, transparent, I think. And I, and I guess all I'm saying is being attentive to, it's not just the restoration of the building. Yes, because you're going to preserve the values that are embedded in that building. It's, it's, it's more than that. It has to be more than that. And um, I think uh, the heritage field generally across the board, not just on indigenous matters, um, is also recognizing that um, it's, a, uh, it's a socially embedded activity. And so now we're looking at, well, what about marginalized communities who haven't been rec recognized in urban settings? Or what about, you know, um, sort of what role can heritage play in, um, in, um, in other social uh, conditions that we're, that we're struggling with um, collectively. Um, and so I think it, it needs to disseminate itself more broadly. Um, but in the indigenous cultural landscape case, what I was suggesting is that, um, you know, to be a little bit more um, uh, critical and self-aware about um, what, you know, what those objectives are. Um, because it could, it may very well be, um, and I've, I've argued this elsewhere, that designation or, re or recognition is not, is not the right path to go, right? Um, so seeking the designation, it, it'll achieve something. And if that's your objective, fine. But it may be that you want to, you know, uh, direct efforts elsewhere and actually just work at the ground level um, to facilitate this sort of um, ongoing connection. Great. Great. Um, another question, can Lisa talk a little more about what kind of cultural programs are currently operating at current tentative World Heritage Sites to enable Indigenous cultural continuity? Uh, 
I probably won't be able to give you a list of specific programs. Um, however, um, of the two that I'm more familiar with, which is um, Trondike Klondike and the Ivivik Herschel Island, uh, I should say that Ivivik Herschel Island is, is um, not in any way actively developing their World Heritage nomination at this point. Um, it's simply sort of uh, sitting on the list, tentative list, um, uh, and it has been actually for many, many years. So whether that one uh, goes forward or not at this time, it's not, it's not really active. Um, and so um, uh, sort of community efforts or programs in place are really just about day-to-day uh, -day, um, cultural heritage programming. Um, the Trondike Klondike is a nomination that is moving forward. Um, and um, again, these, the, the, the community programming is, is um, uh, very much sort of focused on um, supporting life on the land and supporting um, reconnection, supporting language programs and, and so on. And, and, and basically just sort of um, negotiating um, a 21st century Indigenous identity or, or land-based um, identity. Um, so it's not World Heritage specific. I mean, these, these World Heritage um, sort of um, energies are, um, are uh, in, in some ways distinct from uh, the community level programming um, going on. Terrific. Yeah. I think maybe um, we have time for one more question, Claire, is that? that good? Um, there's one here from Joanna Bruck uh, asking, how engaged are younger people with these Indigenous cultural landscapes? And have you seen any particularly effective initiatives to address the, this issue? Well, that's, that's interesting. Uh, great question. And um, realizing now that you've asked it, I didn't, uh, I didn't actually speak very much about it in my presentation. But um, the other, the other, the other sort of conceptual piece to Indigenous uh, cultural landscapes that is critical um, to bear in mind is that, generally speaking, for the most part, they are future focused. Uh, heritage efforts are future focused. So it's quite different from a heritage field that is about conserving something from, from behind or from the past. This is about that, but it's also very much about um, transmission, um, the whole sort of seven generation thinking about, you know, really long term um, um, continuity and transmission. Uh, so elder youth connections are extremely important. So when I said, you know, some of the, you'll hear first from community members, language being important. Well, elder youth transmission is second, if not equally tied with first. So um, the uh, culture camps, those sorts of activities, um, uh, fish camps, hunting camps, on the land camps, those are all extremely um, um, uh, effective and successful. Um, and uh, receive quite a bit of funding and are uh, happen quite frequently uh, across communities in the north. Um, and so I think that's a that's a uh, a great way of uh, beginning that connection. There's also um, through uh, there's land-based curriculum in some of the schools in northern communities. Um, and uh, Language learning is obviously another natural sort of elder youth uh, connection. Um, and so um, the focus on language programming um, is also um, quite uh, um, widespread uh, around the North and so on. And so, you know, in some communities, it's, it's much more, um, a much more seamless, less, um, uh, distinct activity heritage. It, it's much more embedded in sort of the life, the daily life of people. Um, uh, not so much as this sort of separate um, thing that, that, that gets attention. 
um, outside of daily life. Um, and so the, it, it's, it's, there's, there's specific programmings to involve youth, but it's also uh, seems to be just a part of their general uh, environment. Um, and so it's part of their life a little bit differently than um, maybe some of us are familiar with having um, grown up in an in a urban centre, for example. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you very much, Renee, as well, for uh, managing the event. So I'm afraid, everybody, that we have to finish up now, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. And we do have some fabulous questions coming in, but I'm afraid we're running out of time. So just again, thank you for joining us. Thank you to Renee and to Lisa for a wonderful and thought-provoking talk. Thank you to IS, ICUF for um, promoting and awarding the Beacon Fellow. And um, that, that's all I have to say. I just want to wish everybody a good evening and thank you very much. And we'll wrap up there. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>